District level. Uh, my name is Michael Carter. Most of you know that. Uh, my beautiful wife Paulette's here, out over yonder there. Uh, I want to thank the Legion, as usual, and uh, Dick Dunbar, Sharon Grubb, and uh, thank all the servers who are here and uh, treat them nicely. No, uh, I'm. George Carpenter can't be here. He's my minister of propaganda. Uh, he usually tells people. If you're a first time uh, attendee and want to get on our mailing list, just leave your email address with me and I'll make sure George gets it and adds you to the mailing list if you want to get notifications that way. Because then everybody's on Facebook, I know. Uh, first of all, Susan Dyer from the History Center has a couple things to say. Uh, I just wanted to remind everybody that the History Center is open and very safe because there are very few people in there. Um, so if you want to come visit, it's a great place to come out. Tuesdays through Friday, 10 to 4, we're open. And we, are, we have our TC Steel exhibit open until November 13th. So that one is about his time when he was the artist in residence at IU. He had a Franklin Hall studio in the 1920s. Um, I also wanted to thank everybody who has ever donated or shopped at our garage sale. That was done, and we were successful, and they are once again taking donations. So if you have any stuff to get rid of, Wednesdays between 10 and 2 out at the new warehouse, which is on the old GE property, 4015 West Profile Parkway, just bring it on down, uh, and they will accept that. So Wednesdays through the rest of the year, they'll take that. Um, we have some programs coming up. They're all virtual. Uh, so we've got a talk about suffrage coming up in November. I'm not sure of the date. I should, but I don't remember it. So if you want to take a look at our website, we do have some things that you can participate in and you can stay safe. So anyway, come back to the History Center. We would love to see you. All right. Thanks, Susan. Uh, it's good, yeah, it's glad to be back in business after being off over six months. But, uh, we had a program in August, one in September, and then got a great one today. Uh, going forward, we have, uh, I've got a few lined up here. November 24th, Christine Friesel from the uh, Monroe County Public Library. Christine, are you here? Yeah. Did, did you want to say something? I twisted her arm to say something. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, everyone. It's great to see you. Um, I just want to remind everyone that the public library is open the Indiana room is closed but I can get in the back way and so if you have something that you need on microfilm or in the vertical files just email the Indiana room or email me or call and I can scan it and email it to you I can print off a bunch of stuff and you put it at the drive-up window genealogy is a great way to talk to your family when there is a national election around so if you are having trouble talking to your family, just bring up the old stuff from the 19th century and you can get along just fine. So, Oh, sorry. Um, the, my talk next month about the Great Depression is not going to be depressing. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, that's, that's sort of descriptive, I guess. But that'll work. And so that's November 24th, and Christine has given several programs here, so she's an old hand at it. December 22nd, uh, the normal day would be December 29th, but we're going to do it on the 22nd, three days before Christmas. We thought that would be a little bit better. And uh, Sandy Lynch uh, from the History Center and Gib Apple have co-written a book about the history of RCA. Uh, Gib's been out here before, but this will be a little bit different, I think, from the, the other one he gave a few years ago. But... Uh, they're going to speak on the history and show a lot of photos, and then uh, they'll have a book to sell and sign also. Uh, January 26, 2021, Derek Ritchie will talk about the Morton Hunter and Laberto mansions that were up on, I think, 11th Street. They were really neat uh, mansions that are long gone. Uh, and then February, March are still open. We'll get those filled in soon. April 27th, Brad Cook, uh, who's been here several times, He's the head of IU Photo Archives. He has plenty of neat photos to show, vintage photos, so he'll have a lot more of those. Uh, 
Today we're here to discuss World War II, and uh, World War II along with the Civil War was a defining moment in U.S. history. It was so much tragic, frightening, and yet fascinating. That's why so much has been written about it, and why so much has been shown on the screen in the form of movies and documentaries over the years. Uh, my dad was a, uh, probably a lot of us had parents uh, or relatives during World War II. That's not uncommon at all, of course. My dad was a combat engineer for the Army and was at uh, Schofield Barracks near Pearl Harbor when it was bombed. So he was there to see the beginning of the war. And then ended up in New Guinea as a combat engineer where he caught a bad case of malaria. So I have a natural interest in, you know, what's going on with this. Um, as far as the B-17s, as we took the war to Germany and into Europe, our B-17 bombers played a huge part in our decisive victory over the Axis. I looked up some stats on some B-17 planes, uh, pilots this morning. Uh, the U.S. 8th Air Force, which flew daylight missions over Europe, had a 19% death rate. Now that's, that's high. Uh, and if you survived being shot down, you had a 17% chance of becoming a prisoner of war. The average age of a bomber crew member was just 22 years of age. And Mr. Hutchinson, our speaker today, was just 19, I think, right? 19 years old. Uh, he's a 95-year-old author, educator, World War II vet. He earned three air medals, filing 20 combat missions, 14 as lead crew, as a teenage radio operator and gunner on an 8th Air Force B-17 Flying Fortress over Germany, 44 and 45. And we're honored, and I'm glad, so glad that he agreed to come and speak to us here and tell his story today. So, James? Pick on us real quick. Now, we did get hit twice, and uh, 
I'll tell you that a little bit later. But the mission started. We lived in Bonford Huts in England, a little town called I, England. I was with the 490th Bomb Group. There were 43 other American bomb groups there. We had England plastered with bomb, the bomb fields, and each field had at least 54 B-17s or B-24s. But a mission started about three the night before. They would tell you that you were ordered to fly a mission, and the at about three, three o'clock in the morning, they get you up, and you were dressing for forty below zero, and you were going to have, you knew you would be on oxygen. So we usually slept in our long johns anyway. So getting out of the bunk was easy. You put on yeah. your, put your electric suit this picks up over your long underwear. Then you put on the heaviest clothes you had, and then you march. Man, you're going march down to the mess hall. I gave you a very good breakfast because you were flying a mission and you weren't going to be back for several hours. And so we got real eggs and real meat, et cetera, and it was great. On the days we didn't fly, we just had powdered eggs, et cetera. So that was our reward. From the mess hall, we caught a ride down to a briefing room and they had a big, big room where they had a map on the wall, but it was covered. It was a map of Germany. And we all got situated and they pulled back the curtain and we learned where we were going. And the next step was down to the equipment room, pick up parachutes, parachute harness, and headsets and a mic on out to the plane. That's a ride out to the plane. Now in, in a bombing field, the planes were parked next to the runways two or three at a time on concrete parking spaces. We call it hard stands. The B-17s couldn't sit on the mud. They had, they had to have special parking devices. And so once you got to your plane, you checked everything out and make sure the ground crews had already put everything in place. They loaded, they loaded the bombs the night before. They filled the gas tanks in the wings, and they got us ready to go. And then we sat and waited until the weather would occur over the target. The tower would tell us when we could take off, and we had to wait for the green flare. If the weather went over the target was bad, we might just grab the mission and send us back to our consulates. But that was very frustrating because at our ages, we thought we were indestructible, and our job was to get that uh, 35 missions in and get home, get back to high school. And uh, so that once we took off, we knew that we knew that our first mission was to Berlin. It was the longest mission I ever flew because you fly all the way across Germany to get to Berlin. And we had a beat up plane that, uh, they always put the new people in the back in the beat up planes. Why? Because the good people didn't want to fly with the new people. The vendors didn't want to fly with us, wing tip to wing tip. So they said, you're in the back. You work your way to the front. So after four missions, we did work our way to lead crew. And that, that was a thrill because now it was a, sort of a dubious honor. You were you were a lead crew, brag about that, but you're also the target all the time. <laughs> you were leading 11 other planes in the flight, top, middle, and bottom. And uh, then you had the long haul to uh, your target. And uh, we watched, anxiously, we watched for airplanes or enemy planes. And we watch for in new places where there might be flak. Now flak is a big shell about 32 inches high with a 32 inch slug in it. And they shoot it up there 25,000 feet. And it, if it hits your plane, you're done. If it misses your plane, it just explodes like a shotgun shell. And pieces of steel go through the air, iron, go through the air everywhere. Riddle anything it hits. And so we all, and uh, so we, we, they told us where the flak was, but from time to time we would run over it because they moved it on barges or trains, the big flak guns. So they had portable flak guns, they had flak towers, gun towers, and basically it was just a crapshoot to see if you got through there, and uh, if you evaded all, invaded, evaded all the fighters, 
And we had fighters along to protect us. We had P-51 and, and P-47 under boats. And they would escort us by the time I got there. Now, early in the year, early in the you know, war, there weren't, there, our planes could only go so far, they had to turn back. And those poor guys had to fight their way to the target, drop their bombs, and come back and pick up our protection. But then somebody got smart and said, okay, we'll put extra fuel tanks on those P-51s and P-47s. And so they could escort, by the time I got there, they'd escort us all the way to the target. And of course, when you saw the target ahead of you, it wasn't hard to tell you were there because it was just, the sky was just black with exploding shells. Of course, the fighters didn't go in. They were smarter than that. But we had to go in. And so we went, here we go. You see, you see this target out there, about 20 miles away or so. The pilot tells me, oh, I got, I'm a radio operator gunner. I forgot to tell you that. I'm a radio operator gunner. And uh, so the pilot would tell me, well, send the message back. We're at the initial point to start the bomb run. And of course, once you started that, you were just sitting ducks going right in. And, Flying into the flat. Uh, even though we were young and, and optimistic, we were young and, up, uh, and thinking that we could, couldn't be destroyed. We were still a good time to pray when you start flying into that. Uh, you, you can't vary. The bombardier takes over the plane, and the bomb site takes over the control to the plane. And so actually the bombardier is flying it right into the target. When the lead crew drops their bombs, everybody behind him drops theirs. So we just plastered them. This is late in the war, I'm not telling you. The early war, it was something different. But we had so many planes late in the war that we could send out five or 6,000 planes a day. And uh, five or 600 a day. And uh, I was on a couple of thousand plane raids. But we did have control after about two, two years. I got there in 44, November 44, and we had decimated the German Air Force practically. And so it was, we had an easier time of it. And they said, well, you boys, the missions were 25, and you could go home. But we got there late, and so they said, the missions are now 35. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and so that was our, our welcome to England, you know. And, uh, but that bomb run, when you, you dropped your bomb, you could actually feel the plane go up. You had about 5,000 pounds of bomb. And you dropped those on the plane, zipped up, and then you came on out of the flak and uh, reorganized and regrouped, reformed your group. And you were now the only problem you had was getting home. There were planes that were damaged and couldn't go home. There were planes that got shot down. I'm talking about bombers. <coughs> and when you have 10 men on a plane, you know, and every time a bomber goes down, that's somebody yells, We need more gunners, we need more kids. And we were kids. I mean, we were just. I was 19, I ne thought I'd never see 20. I could, I could be in to get serious about it. And we had a buddy, Lucy's eye. Now, on that plane, we were dressed for that 40 below zero. But we were also dressed for the flak. The pieces of slug come through that plane. Didn't have to be very big to get you. So we had on a flak jacket, front and back, and it was steel in cloth. It was cloth woven steel and then cloth covered. So that protected our front and back. Our head, we had a helmet on. A helmet, steel helmet that had special ear flaps. And uh, okay, hit the next one because I think I've covered that. Now Lee? Yeah. When you your crew was pretty much the same guys the whole two years? No. Oh, well, Mike, that's me. I don't know. Hey, go back. It's that arrow right there. Look, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> right arrow. 
The writer of 19, this was taken after our 12th mission. Mike. Microphone. Put your mic to your mouth. Mic to your mouth. It was taken after the 12th mission. <laughs> and uh, they took a group picture and the individual picture. That ring you see on my hand is still here on this hand. I've had it all these years. And you can see my, this is our 12th, 12th mission at Minnows. You get an air medal every two, six missions. So that was our 12th air mission. And the, our reward was that they took a group picture and, a, and an individual picture. Okay, Mike. You're not alone. <laughs> yeah. That's the way we dressed to get on that plane. What do you say? That's the way we dressed to get on that plane, and it was a sort of pills order at Doughboy, though. We had the chest pack parachute hanging on to the I posed that actually. Well, my buddy said, let's send the pictures home. And so I posed that one. But that was a parachute hanging on the front of you. Okay, next. This is a crew. This is, this is our, the reason that you, there are not 10 men there is because we were lead crew. And the command pilot, the command navigator, command bombardier didn't want their picture taken with us. Okay. But there I am again with my teeth out. My buddy said, you look awful. But the ring is still down there. <laughs> I'm, I'm fascinated with this ring. Uh, okay, next. How was your lucky ring? <laughs> it was an air cadet ring. And an air cadet ring, and it became my lucky ring. And then it became my wedding ring. Because my wife said, well, you got here, so let's just use this. <laughs> and uh, there we are lined up for takeoff. We took off about every, every three years three to four minutes. We're loaded with bombs and we're lined up all the way back. You can see the hard stands off to the each side of the runway. Okay, next. There we are, headed, headed out in that formation. That's our outfit. Okay, next. That's the way we were dressed. The white flak jacket, the oxygen mask, the heavy gloves, steel helmet, the throat, the throat mic you don't see, but it was on there. One of the things about oxygen was that you had to quit, keep squeezing that periodically. You had to squeeze that thing or the ice would freeze in it. Your breath would freeze. So we had oxygen checks all the way, all the time we were at high altitude. Okay, next. That's another one of them, that's one I flew on. I came home and became a school teacher for 37 years. It's a lot like being in combat there too, you know. <laughs> but it was elementary school, and then they made, they made me principal. And then I could fight the parents as well as the kids. <laughs> but, so I went to the administration building for 12 years, but I missed the kids. So I went back to elementary principal again. So I finished 37 years, and I didn't do much with my diary or anything until my daughter, my daughter is with me now, and uh, she said, you got to do something, and so I dug out my old diary and wrote it up, and then I started collecting, I said, history, they're forgetting us, they're forgetting us, guys, guys are dying, I've become an antique, I'm, I'm a relic, people don't. My Lord, I saw a World War II veteran, he was walking. You know? <laughs> and, you, and you go like that. And it, so I started collecting stories from other guys. And they'd write up where they were having it, and they, then they would pass, perhaps. And anyway, I made it known that I was editing stories. And so that's what I've done. I, for the last 20 years, I've edited, collected and edited stories of the guys. We were there. We did it, and, we'll, and I'll tell you about it. And so my books are not really books, they're collections of 
anecdotes written by various veterans from various airfields. And uh, it's, it's history I'm trying to promote. And I barely make enough to pay for the books. It's not about money. It's about getting even, you know. <laughs> and so, okay, the next one. There's that flak. That's what they shot at us. That's the shell on the right and the, and the bullet. And when that thing would explode, you know, shot you. And so you always had holes in your plane when you got home. And it was kind of a sport to tell the ground crew to count the holes. See who had the most holes? Different, different crews. It's kind of a gruesome, kind of a gruesome game to play. Okay, next. Those are the guys that shot at us. That picture came from a German, from a German library. It took the ten men, ten men to operate that thing, and that's the picture they chose to put in some of their material. Okay, next, and that's what, and that's what it looks like. If you dodge, we could have called it dodgeball, I guess. But you see, it's just, it's all, it's all in the odds, and, and really, it's a god in God's hands, and you learn to pray real fast on that. And if you get if the fighters hit us twice, we had a 109 hit us. It took out, he took down two planes, and we had some M, uh, the jet, the ME-262. It was so fast that we couldn't compete with it. Our P-51s would do a, it was so fast it couldn't do a close loop. It took a mile or so. Our P-51 would get in behind it and shoot it down. That's the only way that the defense we had. But when they lit, but the flak is there. You just see it. And if you see the shell explode to the fire in the center, you know it was too close. And that's when our our waist gunner got his lost his eye because a piece of that flak hit, hit right above the rim. And we were in a snowstorm. We went, made it back to the base and looked down on the snow covering the base. And he was he wasn't bleeding because the blood had frozen but already below. And uh, so we went on to the next field. They directed us to the next field and, and we left him in the hospital. Actually, it was the last time I saw him. Our ball turret gunner got switched to another plane and he lost his life 11 days before the world, before the war ended. He was shot down and it, by Nine of them parachuted right into an SS, a German SS training camp. So the German took them out and shot them that, shot them that night and buried them in a, under a haystack. This happened over Czechoslovakia. So they had a big trial about it, and uh, I located the transcripts of the trial. And the servants who were there in the town, have, I had their testimony. Which I hope to put in the next, in the next book, in the last book I call it. Okay, next. That's the copy of the Memphis Bell. What I did a few years ago, I started writing these old things. They come in Indianapolis. I go up and take a ride with all the news people, and then they got my free ride. I've been over in Indianapolis a couple of times, and over in Louisville, and. After the crash in Connecticut last, last spring, I think I, I've written my last B-17. Okay, the next, that copy of the Memphis Bell, by the way, was you did a movie. This is our, these are our protectors. That's P-47 on top, P-51 on bottom. We also had the P-38. Okay, next. Way back up. Those are the German planes. I, should, I may have got shot down right now. Those are the German planes that gave it in Texas, and the bottom one is the jet. It's, he's, it's over to Dayton. So is the Memphis Bell. The Memphis Bell's at Dayton. Okay, next. Another Air, Air Force shot. 
Air Force did a lot of photography. Okay. That's one of ours. Everybody in our outfit claimed he was on that plane. <laughs> I do too. <laughs> okay, next. Everyone going down. And uh, you can see it. I saw several go down, and you can see guys bailing out. You can see other guys playing like that that didn't have a chance. And I think that one was called Longer Still Falling from up above. And he got a direct hit. Okay, the next one. That's a B-17 nose after a piece of flak hit it, a uh, flak shell exploded there. And there's a little chair sticking out there that it's a bombardier seat. And the navigator was back under the window, so he was wounded, but he managed to stay alive. And he guided him back home. That plane made it back to England, which is just unbelievable. It was just a, such a tough plane. And uh, several times we got up and had engines go out on us. But that thing was just blowing, the nose blowing completely off. Okay, the next one. That took a wing off. <coughs> yeah. And uh, just, just tore it in half, actually. And then when you had done that happens to you, you can't get out of the plane. You're just pinned to the wall. So you're in here. You're numbered up. Next one. And if you made it to the ground, and uh, they didn't. See, the civilians would try to kill you if you made it to the ground. You parachute, you shoot, parachute to the ground, and the natives come after you. Go, you just bombed them. I can't blame them. And the men will try to kill you, and the women will try to get the silk parachute. As a, that was a joke we had on there. And uh, at that was a POW camp where they put you. And we had, I think we had 94,000 guys as POWs. Some of them went down. That spent as many as three years in there. And so it, the guard tower inside that big fence was a little fence just about this high. And it was called the tripwire fence. And if you, got, if you touched it, they would shoot you. The law was you, you, don't, you don't touch the tripwire. And uh, some of the guys, that, some of the stories I have from guys in POW, unbelievable. The, uh, one guy said we were starving. The Red Cross would send packages, but the guards, the German guards, would take them because they were starving too. And so one guy said that they, there was some new construction within the camp, and they pulled out some of the nails and fed them to the horses. And when the horse died, they had fresh meat. <laughs> Another guy said the commandant had a, a big doberman that he thought so much of make a leather collar. And then Doberman disappeared one night. All they found was the collar. I guess he was too tough to eat, I guess. So it's, so it's a story like that that tear you up. And many of those guys came home and lived a few years and then died. They're not counted in the casualty list. And uh, like in our little hometown of Bedford, we've got 123 guys listed. The Gold Star Mothers had honored us with the plaque of 123 that died. But what they don't consider is that a lot of those wounded and a lot of those POWs only lasted 10 or 15 years. So their life hadn't been entered, been dead to, to. Okay, next. I always put the Holocaust in here because I want people to remember why we did it, why we had to go. And you see that little, that family, very well dressed people. There's some children in there, but they would come in the middle of the night and just roust them out and throw them on, on a cattle car or something and take them to Auschwitz or there were 13 other places they could take them. And then they sorted them out, and the healthy ones got to be slaves, and the weak ones and the old ones got to be burned in the Holocaust, which stands for fire. Etc. Okay, the next one. That's where that's just one of the places they end up. They've saved that. They haven't torn down any history like we've had around here. And they have actually 
they save it as a monument to what happened, even though people said it wouldn't. It hasn't happened. And so we're not destroying history, we're saving it. Is there anything next? <coughs> Queen Elizabeth would come down and, and the king, and they would come down and visit us. He's here in a white dress. Now that's the mother, that's the mother queen, the queen mother. And they're congratulating the crew and etc. That little skinny woman in the back is a princess who is now the Queen of England. So she was 17. I always hoped she'd come to our base and I could get a chance to talk to her. But that didn't happen either. <laughs> so now my hope is I go back to England and talk to her. <laughs> and that won't happen either. But I did send her that first book. And I got a letter back from her lady in waiting, Tabitha somebody. And so I do have a connection to the Queen of England. It is very thin. But you see, we were losing guys so fast early in the war that Hitler called his queen, queen mother, or his worst enemy because she was always trying to build her morale and, and he was bombing London and tearing everything up and killing the RAF guys left and right. And so she, she did this, she and her husband did this. Okay, next. Oh, that's the letter. I thought you wouldn't believe me. Uh -huh. <laughs> so there it is. And uh, Hedabel White. Okay. And uh, next, in my diary, my diary, I, every day I came, every day I came home, I would sit down and write a diary. You're not supposed to keep a diary, but everybody did. That's where I get most of my information. And uh, so the beauty of it was, I was still an artist even then, but uh, the beauty of it was I could draw what happened and then I, the next day I could cut it out of the stars and stripes and put the information right in the, in the book. But that's what started this whole thing. Okay, next. And there was another page, I guess. We were bombing the oil storage. Our, our target. The bomber's job was to destroy the fuel, destroy the railroads, destroy the bridges, make it impossible for Hitler to move anything. And his last big push was the Battle of the Bulge, and that's when we really tore up everything. We just destroyed Germany's transportation system. And they had some soldier, German soldiers walk back from Bastogne and melted. They ran out of fuel, left the vehicles, walked home. Okay, next. And this is the best part of the whole deal. We were, Holland had been starved for two or three years. They had a lot of people just starved to death. They were living off of onions and tulip bulbs. And the minute Germany decided, after Hitler committed suicide, uh, that was kind of a funny story too. He, Hitler married his mistress, and they both, the same day, they both took poison and shot each other. And it was recorded as the shortest honeymoon on record. <laughs> that's, that's a sick joke. Anyway, <laughs> we're dropping 10 and 1 boxes of food to the people in Holland. Germany surrendered called a ceasefire on May the 1st. And so we had permission to go in 500 feet and drop the food and come back out the same way. We were, and we were not to be armed, no, no guns were shown. So we loaded the B-17s and went in. And then it made, I made two of those missions, but uh, some people made five and six because we they were just in dire shape. And uh, even today, I have a friend in Holland. They have marked all the crashes of B 17s and Allied planes in, that had crashed in Holland. And uh, every May, they have a little ceremony where they take the little planes up and drop 
code on parachutes to reenact, sort of a little miniature reenaction. And they keep better records than we do, and they they know more about us than our than my the people do today here. Okay, let's see the next one. That may be it. No, that's the grave of my one of the Dutchmen. Name is Frank Leak, and he went. He took that picture for me. That's our ball turret gunner. That I, my buddy got switched to another plane, bailed out, and was ex executed 11 days before the war ended. That's Wilbur Lesh. His family was from Missouri, Jefferson City, Missouri. The family had five boys, and only one survived the war. That's the name. Wilbur was a brilliant kid. We'd sit around and read comics, and he'd, he'd be working on these physics or chemical books. You know, he'd probably go back and be somebody. Okay. I think that does it. Oh, oh yes, there's no man here selling books. <laughs> but uh, I hope you've enjoyed. This is just me rambling. I'm 95. I should be. I should be home watching old westerns or something. <laughs> but I do this. I do this because I enjoy writing. I write it, nobody read it. I send some to the Bedford paper. I'll send any of the Bloomington paper if I ever ask for them. And. Uh, but the most popular ones are the ones on growing up. I mentioned to the librarian. Growing up before the war was the fun. And then one on the pets. If you're a pet lover, you would love that book. Because it's just a bunch of short stories with drawings. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to come up here. Sorry I didn't do that. go to college after we come back from the war? As far as I'm concerned, the GI Bill was one of the greatest pieces of legislation that ever passed Congress. I hadn't even graduated from high school, and I came back and went through three degrees at IU, taught 37 years, and if you told me that at age 17, I'd say, you're crazy, I don't have a dime, I can't go anyplace. The GI Bill made the difference in this country and proved that we could pay to college if the students were serious and if the college would stay open. I've contacted IU two or three times asking them if they want, want me to come up in the history department and talk. Never heard a word. I contacted two other, two other outfits here in Bloomington. Never heard a word. But I can get on the TV down at Bedford. Our high school had a little TV. A little, video program. And I can talk to the library and I can talk to the Bloomington Legion. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, now if you don't, if you don't uh, care for a book, pick up one of the blue cards because you do have your, I want to tell you again, you do have the videos. It, I think you'd enjoy them. Uh, Elliot, they made them down here at Ellettsville, Smithville phone. How many books have you wrote, Lee? Um, I'm on number seven. Four, four World War II books, and then my pre-war book, pre-war book. And I've got a good bandy going on. I just can't seem to get it finished the way I want it. If you have any more questions, be sure and fire away. Did you lose any crew members? Yeah, well, but we lost him on another plane. We trained with him for six months or more. Then when we made lead crew, they took off the, the ball turret, put in a radar dome, which could use the same mechanism to raise and lower. And so we had a radar operator on the plane and my lady little gun, so we could bomb through the clouds. So that made it even, you got to fly even more. We could fly now in the bad weather too. But uh, yeah, they took off the tail gunner Put, put the co-pilot back there. So we had a command co-pilot, the command bombardier, navigator, and Mickey operator. So, yeah, we, but we lost people all around us. We didn't make a lot of friends. It wasn't it wasn't smart to get close to people. 
because, you know, we all, whoever was going on a mission and had breakfast together. And then when we came back and were debriefed and told, we told what we had seen or witnessed. Then they went back to the mess hall and they weren't all there. Sometimes they got shot up and landed in, in France or Belgium. We had copied, our ground troops had copied, conquered so much of Europe that we were back almost in Germany with ground troops. So if a plane got shot up, couldn't make it, they could land there in France or Belgium. And that happened to us one time. We thought they were gone. And we were mourning for two days, and here they came. <laughs> they had landed in Belgium. That's one of those interesting stories. When you find that box formation, they're so close together. So this one plane, and the top element, and the next, next plane and the middle element, one of them got car careless. But you were flying in real turbulent weather. You were, you were prop, prop wash, prop wash. And, uh, and so it was hard to drive. It was terrible to try to keep that plane level. And one plane came up under us. Not me, but I mean, at the demonstration. It came up under us, our number three prop, cut into the other plane below it, sucked the body of the radio man out. He ended up in the nose of our plane. And then the rest of them went died. And the sad thing there was that, that boy that got sucked in, the radio man that got sucked into our a plane, had already lost a twin brother who was also a radio operator. And they tried to contact me one day, but I, I knew nothing about it because I wasn't on that plane. And so there was no point to, to me getting into that. But it's just the way things happen. That they wake, they were, they landed in Belgium. Our buddies landed in Belgium with an extra body aboard, and the nose of our plane blowing out. Of course. And but, see, I pick up these stories. I was very lucky. I prayed a lot. I never drank, and I, I was sleep going to sleep when I needed to sleep. And it's, I'm trying to be realistic about it because I wanted that high school diploma. You know, and uh, I finally got it in June before I got out of before I got out of Europe. My mother got it, and uh, the government decided I hadn't learned enough. <laughs> but, so I, that's how I went to IU. I had here's my diploma, and uh, and the world has changed so much that if I hadn't done that, I don't know where I'd be today. But I worked in an auto parts store. And the whole business community has gone completely bad. There are not any jobs anymore. All the jobs around our city square are now Walmart or a couple of other big places. So I don't know what I've been. If I hadn't been a teacher, but I love teaching. Dearly love teaching until the union came. And when the union came, the whole ball of life changed. Because the teachers suddenly weren't working for me anymore. They were working for the union. And they still are. I mean, our education system is shot. If it was shot, Dr. Spock shot it down. And, uh, and that's true. I can prove that. <laughs> so we've got a question on you. Oh, okay. How many B-17s were made and who was the manufacturer of them? Oh, God. Oh, Lord. I didn't know there was going to be a test. I <laughs> A little over 12,000 were made. Boeing made them, I think Douglas made some. It was the Elder Skelter's deal. When I say in one section of my book, I talk about these poor women. These poor women raise a kid, bring them up through starvation, gravy and biscuits, and et cetera, beans for supper. And just when he gets 18, they draft him. He's gone. Then he goes out and marries some gal and turns his insurance over to her. And the parents are completely out of the picture. And that's my bitter side. And, <laughs> but uh, no, that's, and they made B-24 about the same number. And we, we would lose them in accidents, we would lose them in foolish things. They had guys, they had guys that uh, didn't know how to fly, really. But they were switched. 
like we had 12 guys come in who had practiced and done all their pre-training on B-24s. And they put them into our B-17 outfits and they don't know how to fly. And we take them up and teach them. I was in a mid-air collision over England. Two of them just went together again and cut each other, one cut the other one in half. And some guys escaped and some died. Some guys had almost all their missions in, but they died over England. And so it was, you could get bitter about it because they had, these guys didn't know how to fly a B-17. But they hadn't injured all the others, including our team, our crew. And it was things like that that happened. They just happened. They're just so much, nobody knew what was going on. They all were right together. There's one guy in one of my stories, he had a fighter, he'd tell a bunch of fighter pilots to come in and they had to switch from P-47s to P-51s and the commander told him, you, learn to, you can learn to fly that P-51 on the way to Germany. <laughs> <laughs> That's a quote. Somebody said that. I don't know. But, uh, I mean, you, you just, people don't remember don't realize just how rough it was. And so we had our own version of the kamikaze then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. As far as, uh, as far as training, from the first day of training until the person ended up in the B-17 doing radio operator or gunner, how, how long did it take? Well, I was drafted in, I was drafted in August. I was sent to Amarillo, Texas and then treated like dogs if I was in the air cadet. So I was happy. And then they cut me when I became a gunner. I was in basic training. Then in December, I went to radio school. And then in May, I went to gunnery school. And then in, in August, I went to combat crew training school, which is the first time I'd ever seen a B-17. Been, been in there eight months and never been on a B-17. But we learned to fly, learned to ride the B-17, and we learned our positions. And uh, I, I, uh, I had, to, had to learn 22 words a minute, sending and receiving in Morse code. We had to take a machine gun apart, a 50 caliber machine gun apart, put it back together, blindfold it. We had aircraft recognition flashing. And the funniest thing was, I can't begin teaching anybody to use that same machine to teach words to little kids. And, but, uh, was your question? <laughs> how long from basic? Okay. <laughs> how long from the day you were inducted till you were in there? Almost a year. A year? Almost a year. I went overseas in November. I went to service in August and overseas in November. So they trained me that long. And then luckily I got the B-17, which is what I wanted. And they didn't switch me. <coughs> And I got to a great air base that had been B-24s and switched to B-17s before I got there. That's another piece of luck. If you trace it, if you trace my path, sometimes I think about things that happened just at the right time for me to survive. Things happen, you know. And you say, well, are you a church member? And I say, yep. Why? Why not? I made it, didn't I? <laughs> I had God's help all the way. And so, that's the way I look at it. Like, I, like a GI Bill, it was a godsend. Nobody had money, I mean, but we got to go. And the fee was $7 an hour. $7 an hour, they turned the government. They furnished my books, and they gave me $90 a month to live on. And when I got married, they said, she's worth $15. <laughs> so we lived on love. <laughs> then one of these girls came along, and they said, another $15. <laughs> and then another little girl came along, and they said, she's worthless. We won't pay you anything for her. <laughs> and she's turned out to be my biggest helper. You know. <laughs> I don't mention any names. But... You know. <laughs> I try to have a lot of fun and I try to keep going. I had to give up golf after 38 years. I had to give up this, I had to give up that. But I'll be damned if I'll give up to history. <laughs> I'm gonna talk about history. 
And as I say it, never write a book to make money, because you'll never get it. <laughs> yeah. If you want to write a book for satis satisfaction, seeing your name there, Vanity Press is the way to go. So Amazon, I'm on Facebook. I'm on Facebook constantly. I'm, I advertise on Facebook, and uh, books are twenty-two dollars plus two dollars past postage. Today, books are just twenty dollars. You can save two bucks right now. <laughs> <laughs> so start your economy kick. Thank you very much again. I, I, any more questions? Huh? How about a special round of applause to a real, a real hero? Thank you, David. That's what the oldest generation was about. Thanks a lot, James.